We are back once again with Dr. Gavin Kerr. It's always too long between our conversations, and we were just having some fun behind the scenes, and we started getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just hit the play button. Let's have some fun. We're going to talk about mind and world. Gavin has been thinking about this a lot again, revisiting the subject. Uh, and I have in a in a bit myself um, for other other reasons. Um, a lot of these mm -hmm. things relate. You know, they say in philosophy to ask one question is to ask all the questions. And I think that's definitely true, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, Gavin, welcome back to the show. What's up? What's happening? And uh, where are we going to start this conversation today? Because, boy, do is there a lot to cover here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me back on, you know. Um, so everything's cool. We're just winding down now uh, for Christmas. Um, it's been a busy uh, first semester, you know. Uh, for me, a lot has happened um in this you know autumn semester uh, for me not just you know teaching uh, you know everything on top of teaching that's been going on this semester it's been just a a real sort of roller coaster of oh, semesters boy. so i'm glad just to kind of you know relax and you know sort of get a wee bit time this is this is my last sort of thing tonight before christmas before i just shut down just and don't shut do down. anything all right yeah. good. well we'll try and make it worth your while <laughs> yeah but that was that so i was in the states recently did you know of I course, and I was yeah. so sad that we weren't able to connect. But you were at the bottom yeah. of the states; I'm at the top. That was the problem. All oh, right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How that go? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you did know because yeah, because you shared the, the the video on your page, yeah, of the of the talk. That's right. Yeah, yeah you, on survivalism, so people can check that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was brilliant. You know, real great experience. You know, we flew to JFK and then from JFK into New Orleans, and, uh, and on the way back we uh, did our uh, uh, our stopover in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. So a um, real great experience. Loved the States. Absolutely loved it. And uh, people are seem to like me <laughs> at least. So I think so. I think I think we uh, I don't I, I can't speak for Americans in general, but I think there's a very warm attitude towards the Irish. I mean, I'm biased because I, I am <laughs> Irish. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, so, so that was cool. So, I mean, that was that, that was in mid November. Came straight back home. Um, did my MMA fight uh, in early December, and then just uh, closed out the, uh, the 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 semester just there wow. last week, and that's been everything so far. So, and what about writings real... and publications? What are you what are you cooking up on that? Oh part? lordy! So um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I just brought out the um the collected articles book um so collected articles in the existence of God so. Just brought that out so um please and please with how that turn out turned out because whilst it's collected articles they were put together in such a way that you could read each article individually but you could read the book as a whole as if it was just a book on classical theism um so it was i was really pleased it was really providential the way that came together and then um, i'm going to put this uh, article on um survivalism i'm going to put it into article form for the proceedings um of the acpa um and what else have we got? I'm working, I'm working on a ton of stuff at the minute. Um, I want to go back to this uh, Kant stuff that we're going to talk about tonight. I've just finished um, giving uh, a course on the history of modern philosophy. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I want to go back to the Kant stuff and the Kant and Aquinas um, stuff uh, and, and get back to that. And um, I'm thinking just uh, I want I maybe want to work my doctoral thesis up into uh, a publication and, uh, you know, see how that goes. See, see mm. if we can get that published somewhere. Um, I'm sure I'm working on other things at the minute, but um, I've just kind of I've, sh I've shut down all my files in the computer. I'm literally, you know, just indulging myself in reading and nothing but reading oh, uh, so these nice. past few days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without, without actually having to write. So that that's the treat when you can just read and not actually have to write. That's a, that that's the nice bit. Yeah, well, well deserved, Gavin, and always looking forward to all the new things you're working on. And I'll encourage people to go check out that volume of uh, collected articles as well. And we can link mm. that afterwards. I'm Cheers. pretty sure I ordered that a while ago, but I don't think it's mm. shown up yet. I, um, I have to double check on that. Right. Um, they yeah. come from Germany. Um, their distribution, well, I mean, they have distributors in the States and Australia and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the publishing house is in Germany, unless it's sold out. It just like, it just it just occurred to me like I'm almost certain I ordered it, but it would have been yeah. a couple of weeks ago now, and I yeah. I haven't seen it show up, so I'll have to check check in on that. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with most of the articles. Oh anyway. yeah, I'm sure I have them, but I like to support you, and I just like having things all together, anyways. Of course. Um, yeah. All right. So okay. my, so so mind and world, Gavin. I mean, there's mm. a million different ways we can angles mm. we can launch into this conversation. It's it's sure. it's a huge one. Mm. It's one where my thoughts are still all over <laughs> the place. Um, yeah. So help uh, help me see straight. Um, 
on this. Okay. How, how, how do you like to, to angle into this issue? And uh, yeah. how do you think we should view the relation of yeah. mind and world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the whole issues of mind and world emerged in modern philosophy. Um, uh, and there, there, there was the influence of medieval nominalism that helped to bring it about. Um, but the real culprit is Descartes. And so I think best, the best way to think ourselves into the problems of mind and world is to look at the standoff between the rationalists represented, say, roughly by Descartes, um, and the empiricists represented by Locke, but much more fundamentally by David Hume. Um, now, this did have this sort of, you know, turn in modern philosophy had its roots in medieval nominalism, because in medieval nominalism, um, Occam is a, you know, a big culprit for this. Um, the uh, the universal categories that we use to carve up reality, you know, essences, species, um, they don't signify reality as it is in itself. They signify categories that our intellect uses to carve things up. So species aren't real. Species signify a, a mental category by which we carve up what is um, revealed to us in experience. So what experience gives to us is a content distinct from the categorical or conceptual content that the intellect introduces. So the idea here is that experience has a notionally distinct content which mm. differs from the content of understanding where, where you have conceptual or intellectual content. <clears throat> yeah. And that's a key thing um, for the modern philosophers, because if you grant that experience has a content distinct from our conceptual content, then you have to take a journey from experience of the world to our thought about the world. And the whole question is, what guarantees you that the various pathways and bridges that you get from experience to thought adequately represent the objects that you've experienced? So something like Cartesian um, skepticism about the reliability of our representations um, mm -hmm. becomes a pressing and urgent issue. If experience oh, yeah. is in itself um, distinct from the, the conceptual content that we think about as present in that experience, then um, the question is whether or not the bridge that we use to get from experience to thought is a reliable bridge. And so mm -hmm. if, it's, if, if it's not reliable, if our representation patients are uh, capable of deceiving us then we have to w th then the question is urgent um how do we not know that we're not being uh, consistently and systematically deceived all of the time and if we right. don't know that that is not happening we can't know anything at all so we have right. to deal with the the problem of demon skepticism before we can do anything um in knowledge epistemology philosophy of mind so it's with yeah. this idea that experience has a content of its own that needs to be worked up and interpreted into thought that leads to the urgency of a uh, demonic skepticism yeah and that's really. why i like to mm -hmm. start well yeah. really well stated because i think that the you know the Cart Cart descartes demon and the sort of radical you know global structural skepticism is something that continues to really haunt so much of modern epistemology right and you you have these camps yeah, yeah. internalist camps and externalist mm -hmm. camps that really try to 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 deal with it in various ways but you know mm -hmm. i i read a book you know not too long ago um called um epistemic intuition and radical skepticism by bergman and bergman's a very good thinker mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. at the end, at the end of the day, when it comes to the big meta level issues, the meta level circularity issues, um, mm -hmm. which which haunt these these projects, um, he just is like, yeah, it's just um, it's just circular. Uh, but maybe it's sort of benign if you hold the right attitude to it. I'm like, this is not <laughs> this is not a very yeah. good solution to these problems. <laughs> and he admits he's like, if you're in an existential crisis, then uh, maybe it's not benign. Um, uh -huh. So even even though externalist, you know, positions kind of have hope of of of, you know, um, getting around it, if you're just kind of willing mm -hmm. to yeah point to conditions beyond us that might serve for mm -hmm. our justification and stuff that we can't access. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's going to find those accounts like deeply personally satisfying for getting around. Yeah. It, if you know what if you know yeah. what I'm getting at. So yeah. all the point is yeah. these these are still problems in modern epistemology. And maybe Gavin can help mm -hmm. set us straight here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so let's just take the 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 you know sort of kicking point that you know um, you know, experience gives us a notionally distinct content um, from uh, understanding from conceptual content. So we have experiential content and we have conceptual content. 
Well, what happens then is that we get these divisions in modern philosophy between the rationalists and the empiricists, both of whom accept that experience gives us um, a, a distinct type of content um, and then tries to answer how it is that we get from experience to understanding. So you have Descartes, you know, with his famous wax example that our experience of the wax doesn't reveal to us the wax, the substance of the wax, because we first experience the wax as hard and of a certain taste and certain texture and everything. And then another experience uh, reveals the wax as, you know, soft, melted, different taste, different texture. So we have to get beyond experience to our clear and distinct ideas. And it's what our, once we have clear and distinct ideas of things, we've reached the truth of things, you know, uh, on the condition, of course, that God exists and has given us this faculty of clear and distinct ideas, which, you know, we, uh, which, which wouldn't deceive us. Um, on the other hand, the empiricists hold that we have experiences and experience has this content to it. Uh, and what we do is we, first of all, represent these experiences in simple ideas, and then we start putting these simple ideas into more complex ideas. And so our ideas represent our experiences. For both, ideas are representations of what's given in experience. But what is given in experience is not intelligible in itself. It has to be made intelligible either through clear and distinct ideas or through uh, simple ideas being formed into more complex ideas. And it's precisely because there's a jump between experience and understanding that skeptical scenarios um, become pressing. But here's the thing. Um, those skeptical scenarios are only pressing because it is assumed without argument that um, uh, experience adds uh, its own content, okay, has a content of its own. That is a presupposition that experience has a content of its own, that we have experiential content, and that is a presupposition which is rooted in nominalist metaphysics going way back to Occam. It's not mm -hmm. defended at any point. And in fact, Etienne Gilson, um, he wrote uh, one of his um, theses, um, just on the nominalist, the medieval nominalist influence on Descartes, he traces it back to all the thinkers. But the key guy here who helps us overcome empiricism and rationalism, that standoff and the whole problem generated by, you know, experience giving us a notionally distinct content from conceptual content is Kant. Because when we get to Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason, what he is intending to show in the Critique of Pure Reason is it's not that experience gives us a notionally distinct type of content that we need to kind of work up and make intelligible. It's that experience makes available to us objects in the world for thinking. So experience doesn't give us a content. Experience is transparent. It makes objects available to us so that they can be known by us. That's what the whole first critique, well, the first half of the first critique is about, about how experience and how the metaphysics of experience makes available objects for knowing. So experience doesn't have this sort of um, experiential content that needs to be cooked up into intellectual, conceptual content. Experience just makes objects in the world available to us um, so that they can be known. So Kant is the key figure here to help sort of overcome uh, all these sort of skeptical scenarios and problems uh, that uh, traditional empiricism gives us. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's really good. So um, these problematic positions, would you would you call them mediational theories? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So me representational theories. Representational mediational theories. Right. It does seem like these almost ineluctably lead to the possibility of um, persistent global skepticism right mm -hmm. yeah. um whereas if we have something like would you call the the, the alternative you're proposing a direct contact theory something yeah well like i um depends what you mean by direct contact i, I would just call kant's view as, as well as aquinas's and aristotle aristotle's one which focuses on the intentionality um of consciousness mm -hmm. that um experience is a conscious activity it's, a, it's an activity of consciousness or it's an activity of cognition, just mm -hmm. as is understanding. And consciousness itself is intentional. In other words, there is no consciousness unless there is an object which brings consciousness into operation. Right, 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 right. We're not just starting in some isolated thing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. All right, so um, your position on Kant, I just want to um, make this known, is, is not the position of many Thomists. Right? No. no. <laughs> you are a Kant friendly Thomist. There's yeah. many other Thomists who are Kant unfriendly Thomists. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so maybe yeah, we should get into that. Yeah. 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 It, I think it's relevant right now. I just yeah. want to just point it. I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So unfortunately, Kant, um, he doesn't do himself any favours because he's very ambiguous with his language in the first critique. But his translators, his, you know, first generation commentators in English didn't do him any favours as well because they just got him wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, So most people, if they're reading Kant in English, are reading the Norman Kemp Smith edition. Now, Norman Kemp Smith, you know, he did, you know, one of the standard um, sort of translations of Kant into English. Um, there, there, there are like there are a number of issues with his translation of Kant into German. For instance, he translates terms like appearance, object, representation, as if they're all interchangeable, as if the object of thought is a representation or an appearance. And Kant uses these in a technical way in different contexts. Basically, what Norman Kemp Smith presents Kant as is a failed Barclay and idealist. So Barclay, uh, to be is to be perceived. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Kant it seems to be presented in this way that, you know, uh, the being of things is simply our perception of them. We sort of make the world as it is for us. You know, the things as they are for us. And then Kant just tacks on the thing in himself thing in itself because he doesn't Mm -hmm. want to lose the objectivity of the world so the thing for us and the thing uh in itself and so he's basically just barkley with things in themselves but when you actually read kant's critique and you when you read it attentively you realize that kant is not um he's not an idealist um by any means because um (laughs) so uh somebody that i knew teaches at a university here is a kantian used to put uh on uh, exam questions if kant were an idealist why does he have a critique of idealism in the critique mm. of pure reason? So there's literally a section entitled a critique of idealism. Kant is a transcendental idealist or what you could call a critical idealist. And what does that mean? For Kant, the transcendental or the critical problem is the problem of mind and world, how they relate to each other. OK, so it's an epistemological problem. So when Kant qualifies something as transcendental, he's speaking epistemically he's not speaking ontologically so the distinctions that he makes in the critique of pure reason are epistemic distinctions they're not ontological distinctions so when he talks about the transcendental conditions for the possibility of knowledge he's talking about what has to happen epistemically within us in order for knowledge to occur when he talks about the a priori forms and categories Okay, which um, are the transcendental conditions for knowledge. He's saying that epistemically, our sensory consciousness has to recognize the spatial temporality nature of objects which are available to us. And whenever we make judgments about those objects, we deploy the various traditional ca- the, the, the categories of traditional logic in order to make those judgments. But here's the kicker for Kant, and this is where we're going to get to the transcendental aesthetic. Mm-hmm. We would be unable to deploy those a priori forms of space and time and the a priori categories of the understanding were it not for the objects themselves displaying features which are recognized as spatiotemporal and as categorically connected by means of the various categories. In other words, these a priori conditions by which knowledge is possible for Kant would not be turned on or switched on or triggered were it not for the objects which we experience turning them on or triggering them. If the objects themselves did not display these features, then these various categories and forms um, in our thoughts wouldn't be switched on. We just wouldn't have those kind of thoughts. Causality is the perfect example. Kant was all shook up by Hume's critique of causality, that there's no necessary connection between cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And this is why he deploys the category of causality. Were the object of intuition, what we intuit, which is basically our perception, were the uh, object of intuition not to display the reality of causal connection, the category of causality, which is deployed in our thinking about those objects, just simply wouldn't manifest itself. Hmm. So in the the same way that you you take, you know, the, the light spectrum, were the light spectrum not available to us, our eyes just wouldn't see anything. Our eyes respond to the light. So in the same way, the a priori forms of space and time and the categories of understanding re- respond, like our eyes to the light, to those features in the things themselves, so that the things themselves are made available to us for thinking. And this is... Um, should we stop there? Because no, this is, this is great. The... I do have a question. <laughs> The, but and, finish and this, your thought first. Yep. Mm-hmm. This is what everybody misses in the transcendental aesthetic. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
in the transcendental aesthetic, Kant famously says, intuitions without concepts are blind. Thoughts without intuitions are empty. Mm -hmm. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Thoughts without intuitions are empty. Now remember, intuitions are experience. Intuition is what makes objects available to us. So intuitions without concepts are blind. What does that mean? <clears throat> Think about what it is to be blind, okay? It's to see nothing. There's nothing there, okay? So our intuitions, which make objects available to us, were the concepts not involved in our intuitions, intuition would just be empty. The content of intuition would just be empty. So unless the content of intuition is conceptual, intuition would just be empty. Now remember, intuitions make objects available to us. So the content of intuition, the making of an object available to us, has to be conceptual. That's the first part. The second part, thoughts without intuitions would be empty, okay? And what is it to have an empty thought? It's to have a thought about nothing, which is to have no thought at all. Mm. So if thoughts without intuitions are empty, okay, if thoughts don't have any content without intuition, and intuitions without concepts are blind, in other words, there's nothing there in the intuition, then the content of intuition, the content of experience, is the same content as the content of thought. The content of our intuition is the content of our thought. Remember, what led the rationalists and empiricists astray? The content of experience is not the content of thought. And that, yeah. and that is a transcendental argument that he's just giving right there, yeah. right? Because yeah. he's saying exactly. for thought to be possible, this yeah. has to be the case. Thought is possible yeah. because it's actual. Mm -hmm. So necessarily, this is yeah. the case. Is that yeah. is that a correct statement? Of, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Thomas and Aristotle use those sorts of arguments all the time. Yeah. All now, the could, time. now maybe there's a committed skeptic who wants to just deny mm -hmm. that thought is even actual. Do is there any yeah. point in conversing with that person? <laughs> so anybody, well, somebody well, can always dig their heels in at some point, yeah. right? <laughs> and well, and people have, to, right? <laughs> yeah. He has to have the thought and he has to utter that thought mm -hmm. uh, in order to converse. Even if he doesn't want to converse, he has to have the thought himself. Mm -hmm. And if he's having the thought, then the thought has a content. And the content of the thought then derives from something. Right. So, you know, the idea is like, hey, you know possibly this if possibly this then necessarily that right yeah. this is a structure yeah. that's going on here and so it, this, this is yeah yeah correct me if i'm off but i'm just trying to articulate that that this is a transcendental argument and mm -hmm. i think transcendental arguments can be very powerful once you understand what's what's going on mm -hmm. and so to be clear everything you just spelled out is ultimately saying for thought to even be possible these are the necessary conditions yeah. that it must attain mm -hmm. right yeah since thought yeah. is actual these mm -hmm. conditions do attain necessarily mm -hmm. so, right? Yeah. And then that eliminates, you would mm -hmm. say, any sort of mediational theory. Is that a fair nutshell of what exactly? You're... Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So those sorts of theories which make uh, skepticism urgent can respectfully be set aside because they're based on a theory of intuition or a theory of sense experience, which makes thought impossible. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So that is all very powerful and I think right stuff. So, you know, the mediational theories have their problem and their problem is how do we know anything? How do we get anything mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. However, yeah. for a more Thomistic or Aristotelian or I guess even Kantian, and I'm not an expert on Kant, so I got to speak carefully there. There seems to be a problem in, in the other direction. How do we get anything wrong? Exactly. How do we get Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Because that needs an answer. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Before before I get on to that, can I just draw that Kantian bit to a close? Yeah, take take your time. Don't let me you you steer this conversation for sure. Mm -hmm. So so for Kant, um the, the content of experience is the content of understanding. And if the content of understanding is conceptual content, the content of experience is conceptual content. But what does experience do? It makes objects available to us. So objects have to be conceptually structured or have a conceptual kind of structure which enables us to, you know, have that conceptual content. So there has to be some homogeneity between the object that we experience and the conceptual content of our experience and our understanding. Mm -hmm. Put in more Aristotelian terms, the object that we experience has to be a formed object. It has a form, it has an intelligibility, it has a species, which is precisely what the, nom the nominalists denied. Nominalism, yeah. which brought about rationalism and empiricism. So on Kant's view, there is an intelligibility or a conceptuality to our objects 
that brings about an intuition, uh, which in turn brings about a judgment as to the you know categorical nature of that intuition. Uh, so what is happening whenever mind and world relate? There is a passivity to the object acting upon us. That object enables certain epistemic occurrences to happen in us, whereby we engage with the object and form a proposition about the object. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like experience generating a phantasm, uh, engaging the passive intellect, which, or, sorry, engaging the agent intellect to consider the nature of that phantasm, you know, as disclosing uh, the appearance, uh, finally to form a judgment as to the nature of what we've experienced and thereby actuating the possible intellect. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a to and fro of the agency of the subject and the passivity that he undergoes uh, and experience. Mm -hmm. So it's not all just passive reception. Mediational theories are all passive reception mm -hmm. that, you know, things just work their way into us. That's a me mediation. Whoops. Little connection issue. Gentle listeners, we will be doing Q and a here towards the end. So while we wait for Gavin to get reestablished, if anybody has any questions, and in fact, I see there have already been some good ones submitted. Please go ahead and toss them into the chat box, and we'll try to spend some time working through those towards the end. Gavin was on quite a roll there. It's a nice little still frame, though, isn't it? He'll be back in a minute, I'm sure. Let's highlight some comments while we're at it here. Andrew, good to see you. Andrew says he's back at it again with the AI art. He's been making icons of Jesus as represented in various cultures, for instance, China and Afro America. Very cool, man. So I've been I've been all about the AI art myself to switch gears <laughs> rather rather uh, suddenly as we wait for Gavin here. But check this out. This is a recent AI image, uh, mystical and uh, pretty impressive stuff that AI is coming up with. Uh, I want to play a um, game on my fitness podcast of of all the AI images I have and guess which which ones are natty and which ones aren't because boy uh sometimes it it shoots out some really flattering images i have to say <laughs> yeah brown and blue blue eyes yeah like clearly it's not perfect i had some really crazy botched ones too uh the eyes looking a little the right eyes looking a little weird uh check out this one this one's hilarious my wife got a kick out of this <laughs> that ain't natty <laughs> Look, it can't do the hands for whatever reason. It, it, it look at how many fingers do I have there? Like twenty-seven fingers. It's crazy. <laughs> so, anyways, I've been having too much fun with the uh, AI art uh, recently. It's goofy stuff. It's goofy stuff, and the chat bots too. Uh, but we need to kill some time here as Gavin is uh, is getting reconnected. So, uh, yeah, please send in your comments or questions. Um, like I said, we'll spend some time at the end. Gavin's awesome, isn't he? One of my favorite people to uh, to talk to. And here he is, right in there. And he's back. Right. Don't Sorry. worry, we just shared some AI art while you were gone to keep the audience entertained. Right. Uh, no, so I just, the, the internet's been going crazy. Or else it's the Dominicans have sabotaged it for making, you know, Kant Aquinas friendly. Maybe that could have happened. Yeah, so. there's a there's, yeah, conspiracy going on, no doubt. Okay, so I'm trying to think, where did we lose you? Darn it. So did did you get the stuff about the agent intellect cooperating with, you know, the passive intellect? So there's, it, yes, mm -hmm. you, you said that it's not all passive and then you kind of started to cut out at that okay. point. Yep. Okay. So there, um, so in the mind world relation, it's not all passive. If it's just all passive, we have representational or mediatory positions, which generate problem of skepticism. What's happening is that in engaging with the world, that brings in the operation, the agency of the subject to try and understand the intelligible nature of the world too. In Aristotelian terms, engage in abstraction of form. In Kantian terms, that brings in the operation, conceptual episodes by which we ultimately form a judgment about what we've uh, experienced. So there's a cooperation between the passivity of experience and the agency of the intellect brought in the operation by the passivity of experience. And that's that's an Aristotelian position. And that's Kant's position. How close is this to, and maybe you have specific thoughts on it, say mm -hmm. John Haldane's specific um, account of dual instantiation <clears throat> of form. Uh, yeah. And I know he's 
you know, developing an idea that's Thomistic mm -hmm. in general, but not all yeah. Thomas go all the way with him on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I understand Haldian, um, he, he's very much like the Solarsian, McDowellian uh, sort of position that um, when the intelligible, enact, the intellect in act is the intelligible in act. So the, the intelligible in act, the form of the thing bring, brings into operation the agency and actuality um, of the intellect. So the, there's a kind of a mind world identity conformity. Uh, between mind and world. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it's not correspondence. A lot of yeah. these people say correspondence. Barry Miller, too, says correspondence theory is the, the you know, the realist theory of truth gone wrong, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, because with correspondence, you've got one thing corresponding to another, mm -hmm. and then the whole problem is, well, how can you see that link? How can you see the correspondence? You need a correspondence between you know, your thought of the correspondence and the correspondence itself. And then yep. you need what accounts for that correspondence and that correspondence and so on. Yeah. Whereas if you have intentionality, if you have the object being made available to us in experience for thought, then you got no problem of skepticism. Um, and you have the, the, the problem that you, you raised, uh, how is it that we could ever be wrong? The problem because of error. The, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the object, you know, once we experience sort of switches on these conceptual episodes, then why don't we all have the same conceptual episodes? Yeah, or, or you mm -hmm. know, and, and other things, just, just you know, faulty understanding of things, but also hallucinations, stuff like yep. this that needs to be taken account of, right? Mm -hmm. This this is brilliant, because um, what this presupposes, right, <clears throat> what, what, what the skeptics presuppose is that there's a common represent, representational content between... Um, a veridical and a non-veridical experience, actually seeing an elephant and hallucinating an elephant. I was going to say actually seeing a pink elephant, but uh, we'll just say an elephant. So between actually seeing it and uh, hallucinating it, there's um, what McDowell calls the highest common factor there. And that's what allows us to account for uh, error. Um, because, you know, when you have that highest common factor, that representational content, you can't tell the difference, you know, whether or not it corresponds uh, with the object. And so you make false judgments when you undergo a hallucination. But for the sort of the the, the, the intentional sort of view, uh, whereby, you know, mentality has a relation to objects, uh, the problem, uh, we don't have a representational content there. So how is it then that we can make false judgments? The way in which we make false judgments, well, first of all, we explain those uh, a veridical and a non-veridical experience not in terms of there being some highest common factor or common representational content between the two. Really what's happening in a veridical experience is the world is being made available to us. And in a non-veridical experience, some different sort of causal process is going on. We're not being directly informed by the senses, but some different um, causal process is going on. It's a, it's a non-normal causal process, and it's bringing about the occurrence of a hallucinatory experience or some sort of like, you know, the stick put in water, it looks bent. It's bringing about um, some sort of uh, experience which doesn't adequately uh, map on to what is being experienced. Um, and this is known as disjunctivism, that the two experiences are not the same. You're not having the same experience. When you experience an elephant in front of you, you're experiencing an elephant. When you experience a hallucination, you're not experiencing an elephant. You're experiencing drugs. Or when you see the stick bent in water, you're not seeing a bent, you're not experiencing a bent stick. You're experiencing light refraction. Um, so we explain those two different scenarios by saying they're not the same experiences, so they don't have the same experiential content. But in the hallucinatory experience, because you haven't dug deeper into the experience, say with you know light refraction making the stick look bent, you make the false judgment because you don't have all the information available to you. Um, whereas in the vertical experience, you make the true judgment. But here's the thing, <clears throat> making a judgment, um, having knowledge, is it's not indefeasible, okay? judgments, knowledge, claims can be defeasible because there's a process of learning involved uh, whereby, you know, an insight that you've had and formed a judgment out of it can be modified, developed, heightened, um, you know, take, taken in a wider context so that what you once judged to be the case, you can, you know, at a later stage. Oh, no. Have the conspirators attacked again? Seems to be the case. Seems to be the case. It's all right. We'll wait it out because it's worth it. Because Gavin is, is worth it. And this is an awesome conversation. Like I said, 
Uh, keep the questions coming, guys. I see lots of good stuff in the comment section. We'll try to get through as much of it as possible once Gavin is through his main presentation here. He should be back in a minute or two. Let me see if there's any fun comments to highlight. Apatheia says, love Kerr. Haven't seen him in a bit. Yeah, I know. I would, I would have him on every week if I could, but man's busy, has other things to do. What else we got? Lots of, lots of good questions and stuff. I'm going to save the bigger questions for once uh, Gavin's here. Callum says, Pat's looking like a prime hipster with a beard and the beanie. Yeah, I'm not much of a beanie guy. What do you guys think? Wife just got this uh, for me from Costco. I you get a lot of my clothes from Costco. Pretty good deal. And I do live in Wisconsin, and it is quite cold here. So it's not, I think, entirely inappropriate to look the way I do right now. Maybe I'm just finally embracing my hometown culture. The beard's new. I've never been much of a beard man, uh, but my wife actually encouraged it. She said I should, I should try to do a beard this winter, and so here we are. And I will leave it up to my gentle podcast listeners, all of you, to either vote for or against it. The conspirators struck again, Gavin, but good to have yes. you back. Sorry about that. I don't know that the internet's just playing up. Um, this That's evening, okay. So. I, t I told everybody yeah. that we're gonna we're gonna do this as many times as we need because this content is absolutely <laughs> worth it. So nothing to sweat. And yeah, please pick it up. We're talking about disjunctivism. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, in disjunctivism, the two experiences aren't the same. Um, mm -hmm. There isn't a common experiential content because there is no such thing as experiential content on this account. Experience simply discloses an object to it. To us, it doesn't have a content of itself. Experience is an episode of consciousness, whereby consciousness, being intentional, looks to its object that it's trying to grasp. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in the case, in the hallucinatory case, the uh, the drugs are basically, you know, sort of modifying consciousness to think that something is the case when it isn't. Whereas in the veridical case, the object itself is informing or modifying consciousness. Um, How much? To think how yep. much does so one of the best books i've you know really struggled with because it's a difficult book but i think it's brilliant is thought mm -hmm. and world by james ross and oh, when yeah, he yeah. comes yeah. to the topic of error mm -hmm. he focuses a lot on imagination mm -hmm. and he wants to say imagination is is ultimately how we make sense of error in various mm -hmm. ways but also for us imagination is itself necessary for successful thought i don't know if you mm -hmm. spent time with ross's account it's definitely broadly similar to what you're outlining here but yeah. any any thoughts on all that mm -hmm. i haven't really um uh, gone over ross but um in the transcendental dedu deduction and the first critique of pure reason kant points out that imagination is essential um for uh, as a prelude to judgment because when we have an intuition we need to kind of build that intuition up into an image um, you know, you have the, the, the manifold of intuition, and this is kind of like the phantasm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have the various senses, but we bring them together and form the phantasm, which discloses the object to us and makes the object available for understanding. Kant makes the exact, the exact same uh, observation in the transcendental deduction of the A edition, that imagination is a prelude to understanding because, you know, we form our judgments on the basis of objects being disclosed to us in intuition and worked up into an image in imagination. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes the, you know, drugs could bring about uh, an experience um, which the imagination works up into that of an elephant, which isn't there, um, and other times, uh, you know, the actual object brings about an experience which the imagination works up uh, and so discloses to the, inter uh, the intellect uh, an object which is there and is yeah. available for thought. So how would the, the Kantian or disjunctivist, you know, um, respond to the, um, the response of the skeptic of saying, OK, well, that's a nice, you know, account of, of how you might distinguish um, the veridical from the hallucinatory experience, but that doesn't tell me that I know that my experience right now is a veridical one. You don't need right? to. <laughs> you, you, you don't need to. That presupposes what's called the KK principle, that you need to know that you know. In mm. order to have knowledge, you need to know that you have knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, if you're, in, if you're committed to the KK principle, then no matter what item of knowledge you have, um, you, you're always going to have to ask the question, how do I know that I know? And you know, that's part and parcel of the skeptical problem. But on this account, knowledge is simply our way of engaging intentionally with the world. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. 
it's just simply minds or consciousnesses um, <clears throat> uh, sort of sort of reaching out to grasp the world. It's not having an inventory of things whereby we tick off whether they're true or false, given whether we know that we know them uh, to be true or false. So uh, you know, the, the skeptic is presupposing an account of knowledge, which is also almost like drawing up an inventory of judgments. Right. Um, and and we have to... Yeah, I was just going to say that that's right. There's there's many epistemologists who would say we should reject the that we have to know that we know or even know how we know. That's the other thing, too. Um, mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to know how you know something to 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 know something. And I think there's a lot of plausibility mm -hmm. to that. Would you also say, though, because I think it could be go further that for it for hallucinations and, and stuff like that to even be possible, there already has to be that background of the actual veridical experiences, right, for the yeah matter, if you will. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you have well, to already know mm -hmm. the difference between veridical and hallucinatory experiences to even make those conceptual distinctions, right? So there's already like a deep sort of mm -hmm. knowledge in the background that that seems to be kind of inescapable, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Descartes' um, sort of you know skeptical scenarios in the first meditation, they're only pressing precisely because we can see the complete difference of the the veridical experience from the non veridical experience. The veridical, the veridical experience is the bedrock, which Descartes presupposes, and then he points out, well, you know, we know the parallel lines don't meet, but look what's happening um, whenever, you know, train tracks meet at the horizon. These were parallel lines, but look, they're meeting. Here's a hallucinatory experience. Well, that's only striking because um, of our knowledge that the train tracks don't actually meet. So it presupposes a knowledge of uh, what the veridical experience is, is like. Same with the stick when it's put in water. We know that it's straight, um, but look, it's putting water, and so it appears to be bent. You know what's what's going on here? So th those sort of skeptical scenarios are only pressing because we've already presupposed the engagement of the intellect with the objective world. Yes. All right. So that is, a, I think, a very very good account of what I think is probably the strongest objection to um, this non mediational theory is how, mm -hmm. how do you make sense of error? Right. That that that, yeah. that's, that that's really it. Right. How do you make sense of where we where we go wrong on? on mm -hmm. the various fronts. So then mm -hmm. what would you, uh, I guess you already answered it because then somebody might like, well, okay, well, we've got two theories here. Why should I accept this theory rather than the other one? And I guess that goes mm -hmm. back to that transcendental argument, right? That, that I think, yeah. I guess you take that to be pretty decisive in this matter then, huh? Yeah, yeah. Given given the actuality of thought, what are the conditions for its possibility? Well, mm -hmm. uh, because thought is about something, okay, there's, a, there's an intentionality to thought. There's something that brings it into operation. This is and, and this is something that Sellers observed as a strength of the Thomist position, that thoughts systematically differ according to their objects of thought. That the, the, the thing the thing about thought is it isn't that you have thought and then thought has a content. The content of thought is the thought itself. So thoughts aren't the same and only distinguished by their content. Thoughts are systematically distinct from each other. Mm. So a thought is identical to its content, and if it's identical to its content, there's an intentionality or about an aboutness to it, and so um, you can't have thought without an object. Yes, right. That's interesting. Right, that the thought is identical to its content. Right. Mm. You, we, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So De mm -hmm. Descartes sees thought as kind of like you know an empty room, and then the content of thought, or you know the things that you put into the room. The clear and distinct ideas, whereas on, um, say, a Kantian view or a Thomistic view, um, <clears throat> uh, that's not the case. A thought just is the content. It's the aboutness, you know, what consciousness is uh, reaching out to. Mm -hmm. um, that You don't have empty consciousness and then it's filled with thought. You have consciousness brought into operation because there is an object there which operates it, which turns it on. What... um. How much do we want to say about the particular theory of perception here mm -hmm. and um, intelligible species? Where yeah. are you at? Where are you on that? I know uh, Therese, uh, Dr. Therese Corey was on the show not too mm -hmm. long ago, and she's got some yeah. interesting stuff on this. How how close is, is your position with hers, for example, on this matter? Um, so I think that uh, intelligible species... Um, uh, are basically the species of the thing which bring the intellect into operation. And the intellect or consciousness in being brought into operation by the intelligible species becomes united with the object that it thinks about. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the intelligible species signify a distinct reality within the mind 
of the knower corresponding to the formal species in the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am right. And because that seems to start getting close to a representational exactly exactly theory right now i don't want to accuse therese of being a representationalist okay she is a very subtle and uh, you know thomistic thinker um <clears throat> but um i just i i wouldn't hold that intelligible species um are you know components in a mind or in consciousness rather i think intelligible species is the form that the agent intellect takes whenever it grasps the species of the thing uh, revealed in perception yeah. Um, so I've got a million more questions on this, but I want I don't want to be greedy because I want <laughs> you to finish anything that you wanted to put out there. And I also wanted to have some time for audience questions, if you're OK with it, Gavin. Mm -hmm. So if we think about intelligible species, so I'm holding my screamer stick, OK, yeah, which I always now, love. Gavin's always got a <laughs> weapon in hand on this podcast. Uh -huh. So I've got my screamer stick. Now, my hand is taking a particular form in order to grasp the screamer stick and get another hand. OK, I'm holding my throwing knife. All right. The form of my hand holding the throwing knife is different from the form of my hand and grasping the screamer stick. Mm -hmm. Both of them are grasps, but they're formed in different ways. Now, is the form of each grasp something in my hand without the object that it is grasping? No, it's not. The hand stays the same. OK, the hand stays just as it is, and it's able to grasp or wrap itself around the object which is grasped. So the grasp isn't anything in the hand. The grasp is simply the form that the, the hand takes when trying to grasp an object. That's what the agent intellect does whenever it grasps the intelligible species of the thing. Mm. The agent intellect just is as it is, and there's a whole lot of subpersonal stuff going on there, you know, under the skin to allow the agent intellect to do that in the same way a whole load of subpersonal stuff is going on in my hand to allow me to grasp. But once the grasp occurs, once the agent intellect grasps the form of the thing, the agent intellect itself is just formed in a certain way, but that form isn't something in the agent intellect. It's just the agent intellect coming into conformity with the object that it grasps in the same way as that my hands come into conformity with the objects that I'm grasping. So, yeah, so there's nothing. Yeah, go on. Yeah, no, that's a great illustration and analogy. Now, one other thing we want to, I want to ask you about when it comes to the conformity here, which seems mm -hmm. great is um, we're not like sucking the essence dry, right? Like no. we don't, we don't fully comprehend the essence of something. No. through this right yeah. i mean clearly not and that's been one of the kind of caricatured objections against the timistic view that like we, boom we come into contact the essence just sort of pops out of a thing full and complete mm -hmm. and we just have a total soup to nuts understanding of something yeah and then, <coughs> so help exactly. us help us think uh through why that is not what is going on and what the right way to to view the situation is mm -hmm. yeah so we grab something of the intelligibility of the object by which the object makes sense to us but as i said we're not committed to the kk principle um, our initial insight might have got something right, but that can easily be developed and drawn out and we can discover more and more and further. And we might even have to revise um, our initial insights. A brilliant article written by W.V. O'Quine in the middle of the 20th century, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. The classical empiricists, uh, the logical empiricists, he's criticizing Carnap here, hailed that what happens is that we have an initial experience. We program that initial experience into a protocol sentence. Uh, which is basically a simple idea on classical empiricism. And then those protocol sentences allow us to form more complex sentences. Quine argued in Two Dogmas of Empiricism that whenever it comes to our um, uh, verification uh, of statements within science, it's not a one-one cor correlation between a protocol sentence and some bit of experience in the world. It's the web of belief or the science as a whole, whether or not that fits with reality as a whole. But look, think about the web. Some parts of the web are carrying more weight than other parts of the web, and some parts of that web just won't correspond. If you take them in isolation, won't correspond with reality mm -hmm. because the you know in science you know they're deduced from what we've already seen earlier on. Well, it's the same with our knowledge of things, of the essence of things. We'll have some grasp of it, and then we'll start building up the web of belief about the thing that we're or the set of things that we're trying to understand. Now, some parts of that web will have to be modified, but other parts of the web will carry the weight as the web is being mm -hmm. modified. So mm -hmm. knowledge is always a developmental process, and we don't have full, complete knowledge until we reach the beatific vision.
Yeah, what are the implications for the beatific vision? Because I've always figured whatever the case has to be, it has to it has to be some epistemic experience or feature that is radically different than anything that we have in yeah. in this life, right? So the beatific vision, we will see fully and without blemish um, intellectually all that a human intellect can see um, or all that my human intellect or your human intellect or Einstein's uh, mm -hmm. can see. Um, and we will love fully all that a human will or my human will or your human will can love um, because we will be in the presence of the true and the good. Um, so uh, whereas here we have to kind of try and fumble about and figure things out. And sometimes we have these spectacular moments of insight. Mm -hmm. But as, you know, the mystics sort of you know, point out, as Aquinas um, pointed out at the end of his life, and anybody, you know, blessed to have a mystical experience, you know, amongst the gentle listeners, when you have this moment of consolation with God, just this experience that just hits you, it's as if you could just melt away. Your being would be nothing. And that split second of just perceiving the reality of God in some sort of, you know, mystical contemplation, um, all the books and all the writings and everything in the, even your relationship with your family could be as nothing just simply for that experience. And this is something that Aquinas experienced at the end of his life. He wasn't saying that it was nothing, but he's saying it's as nothing compared to that experience mm -hmm. uh, because it, everything is just totally transformed and brought up. It's as if you could just dissolve away and be consumed um, by that experience. So all the knowledge, all your will um, of the good is just drawn into that experience of God and beatitude. And this is what the mystics talk about. And this is an experience that Aquinas had at the end of its life. His life. So it's as if... Um, <clears throat> All, all, all the knowledge and intelligence that you had, um, it, it's like it's like scales have dropped back and you can see it for its full intelligibility for what it is. Yeah, there's I forget exactly where again Aquinas says it, but it's a pretty radical statement that we will see God as God mm -hmm. by means of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it's the, the, through the, the form of God. Yeah. Right. Which is yeah. that that's and that that's a very. It's he said. I forget. You probably know the reference, but I, I remember spending so much time on that, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking that is a very, that is a very radical, radical yeah. thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we we will be the. It, it'll be the the. It's the not like it's just not just like my propositional knowledge is filled mm -hmm. out. It just yeah. can't, can't be that, right? It's something yeah. radically yeah. other than this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because it'll be the intelligible species of the divine essence, which is the divine essence itself. Right. And remember what I was saying about the agent intellect. It doesn't, you know, put something inside of it by which it understands the thing. The agent intellect comes to be conformed to the thing. And that's what the intelligible species is. So in the case of God, we're conforming our intellect to the divine essence. In other words, we are becoming divine, i.e. theosis deification mm -hmm. we're becoming divine to the to the extent that you know a creature can be and the whole issue about theosis there but the the our our intellect and our will is becoming conformed to divinity and so it's becoming divinized mm. it's becoming like unto god yeah i think it was um maybe alex Proust actually who connected this with descartes at one point i feel like he just had a short blog post i'm mm -hmm. pretty sure he did where he said that he thought that the Cartesian quest for certainty actually ends into beatific vision. That's well, yeah. that's where you'll have it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's where Descartes will get it. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, I mean, flawed and all as Descartes was, you know, in, in his philosophy here, I mean, certainly, ho hopefully he's enjoying the, uh, the, the beatific vision, um, you know, in the afterlife. Oh yeah, yeah, God, yeah, God willing, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I actually love Descartes. You know, I I disagree with him, but I I return to his his work, and especially I, I don't know. There's something there's something I've always liked about about his mm -hmm. meditations, just just reading them, and and yeah, and I guess there's a way that you could maybe see him as making various transcendental arguments that might be a little bit stronger than the typical um, formulations people like to knock down from from mm -hmm. Descartes as well. But mm -hmm. that's for another conversation, I suppose. Gavin, anything else you want to mm -hmm. talk about before we get to questions here? Mm -hmm. No, no. I'm happy to get the questions. You know, dive on into it. This is my final, you know, rodeo before, you know, shutting down for Christmas. So we can go for it. Let's do it. All right. I'm going to pick around here and just grab the ones that are sort of most relevant. Uh, and then I'll, I'll try and get through all the ones that you guys sent in, you know, if 
before Gavin has to split. And it is later over there for him. Uh, Danny says, how would you respond to someone who, in spite of arguments against the simulation theory or the evil demon hypothesis, nevertheless maintains that it is still logically possible? Yeah. See, um, the way I would respond is I would say, well, how is it logically possible? Okay. O unless you have a different account of perceptual experience from the, let's say, the Kantian, the broadly Kantian account that I'm given, um, <clears throat> the the the, it, the uh, simulation theory, evil demon hypothesis, are just not possible because that's, it, that's the point of the transcendental argument, right? It, exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm for the skeptic to make that argument that you know perceptual experience is different. They have to start deploying metaphysics. They have to abandon their skepticism then, and they, they have to deploy, they, they have to start, you know, doing a metaphysics or a transcendental argument, you know, that holds that perceptual experience is like this rather than that. So immediately you're into a metaphysics um, of experience. So I would just run that transcendental argument again. I mean, that that is the tra Kant's transcendental aesthetic. That's what it's all about, mm -hmm. to show that, you know, these sorts of scenarios are impossible. Right. Um, <clears throat> give, yeah. So do you think it could be, Danny has a follow-up here. Okay, well, maybe they might say, all right, maybe those global scenarios are impossible, but what if you were just recently invaded, recently put in a brain in a vat? Would your response be any different? <laughs> be the same, be the exact same. Because that it, still is a globally radically skeptical yeah. position, uh, right? Yeah, it would, be, it would be the exact same, that given the nature of thought and experience, um, it is impossible for experience to have its own distinct content by which we can be uh, deceived or by which, you know, we can be made to think um, that we're experiencing something that we're not actually experiencing and that that's what's, you know, conducing to knowledge, which is the brain in a vat scenario. Um, so it, it would be the exact same response. Isn't that... it funny yeah, how the um, skeptical scenario sort of just change with the ages? You know, if it's demons mm -hmm. and it's brains and vats, now it's simulation. Yeah. Absolutely. But they're still all the same sort of structurally, globally yeah. skeptical scenarios. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're working off a nominalist view of what perception is. Yeah. <clears throat> some, some I think, are probably actually more plausible than others. Um, mm. I find the, the ones that kind of depend on physicalist <coughs> assumptions to be less plausible than, than mm. the Descartes' demon, actually. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because we tend to think that, you know, given the immateriality of thought, an immaterial agent would be able to, you know, um, kind of, you know, have control over thought in the way that, you know, material drugs can have control over the material body. Okay. Um, but I, I think when you just think through the metaphysics of it, it just, it, it doesn't work. It's impossible precisely because of that transcendental argument. Right. Yeah. 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 So uh, real quick, before I forget, I want to ask you, you mentioned mm. how, a lot of the translators didn't do Kant any favors. If you're the recommend for the gentle mm -hmm. listeners and even for myself, because I've, you know, I've been, you know, struggling with Kant myself for years and years. Who, 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 who to read on Kant? Who to give a couple books and. I think Paul Geyer. Um, so um, what, I, what I'm actually going to do, I, I still use the Norman Kemp Smith translation, but I kind of just, you know, see past, you know, the sorts of ambiguities, you know, in his translation. Um, the, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, you know, sort of, me, you know, get the Paul Geyer, my personal copy of Paul Geyer and read the whole thing again um, using Geyer um, and sort of compare, you know, the, the major sections. But the Paul Geyer did uh, the translation of Kant. You could always read Kant in German. OK, now you could always I, do that. I can't. Yeah, well, <laughs> you could learn German just to read Kant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, Paul Geyer, um, you know, he's a great uh, sort of um, you know, translator, uh, writer on Kant. Kenneth Westphal, um, he's got a great book, uh, Kant's Transcendental Proof of Realism, because um, in uh, one, one of the arguments of the transcendental deduction, Kant uh, makes use of this idea that there's an affinity between the manifold of intuition and the objects of which it is in a, a manifold, that there has to be some sort of an affinity there. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to produce uh, a manifold of intuition. In other words, the transcendental argument that um, we've been given. So that's Kant's Transcendental Proof of Realism. Brilliant, brilliant book. Um, the Wilfred Sellers, Science and Metaphysics, Variations on Kantian Themes. Chapter one in that, um, he gives a reading of uh, Kant's uh, thought in the first critique, uh, which draws it very closely to Aristotelian, an Aristotelian view of perception. Uh, there's uh, John McDowell, Mind and World, and John McDowell's uh, Woodbridge Lectures, which were published in Having a world, the World in View. 
um, where <laughs> McDowell actually criticizes sellers for not being thumistic enough in his reading <laughs> of Kant. Um, yeah, so I, I'd recommend those authors. Okay. Um, but Paul Geyer is certainly the doyen of uh, Kant uh, scholarship. Oh, Henry Allison as well. Okay. Henry Allison, uh, Kant's Transcendental Idealism and Interpretation and Defense. He's the one that made, you know, really drove that point home to me that when Kant is making these distinctions, they're transcendental distinctions, which means they pertain to our epistemic procedures, not to our ontology. So when he talks about the thing in itself and the thing for us, that's not an ontological distinction. Mm -hmm. That's an epistemic distinction. That right. if we don't know the thing, it's just as it is in itself. It's not available to us for knowledge. Once we know it, something happens in us by which is available to us. And so it's now a thing for us, but it's not an ontological distinction whatsoever. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, here's one from Callum. He says, would I be wrong in thinking intuition is the link between thoughts and objects in the world or the medium for objects to be within thoughts? Um, I would say that intuition makes objects available to thought. That intuition, um, it depends what you mean by medium. Um, if you mean like a medium, like, you know, a window, okay, a window which just makes something available for sight, then that's fine. If it's a medium insofar as it represents or it encodes objects in any way then we've got you know a mediation the mediational theory right mm -hmm. but it, but if it's just a medium if it's a if intuition perceptual experience is our way of being in the world and so makes the world available to us um that's perfectly fine <clears throat> what about moral experiences gavin yes kant talks about these in um oh the well it's actually the experience of the sublime in the critique of judgment um, you can have an experience of the sublime that there has to be, to be um, and he does talk about moral experiences as well and the critique of practical reason. In fact, moral experience at the end of the first critique is what he uses to prove the existence of God. Mm -hmm. um, we have a proof for God's existence by means of practical reason. But he, he talks about we have these experiences and they're not experiences available to speculative reason, but they are experiences available to practical reason. And so were it not were there not something about that kind of reason which is sensitive to moral qualities or sensitive to the sublime, um, yeah, we, we just wouldn't be able to have those experiences. So in having those experiences, there's something in us which is sensitive to real uh, f features of value in the world when it comes to morality or real features of the sublime that they awaken in uh, ju just as the the categorical nature of objects brings to life the categories within us so to so too does value and the sublime bring to life experiences there's the um, value window as well yeah yeah right. yeah mm -hmm. absolutely um so and um, i i had a i had a student recently who presented a paper where he was talking about the experience of the sublime and mm -hmm. i pointed out to him that if people don't have you know if if we have this in kant that there's this faculty for you know, disclosing the sublime to us. <clears throat> it, 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 if people don't allow that to be disclosed, does that mean that they're not being fully human or fully authentic? They're not living a fully human life. If they don't, you know, sort of engage their sort of agency for detecting the sublime, i.e. God. Um, so it's an interesting thought in mm -hmm. Kant, you know, uh, whether or not, you know, for Kant, you're not, you're not fully authentically human unless um, you have an experience of the sublime. Right, yeah. Well, I'm into that. Here's one from Andrew, and uh, you may have already answered this, but we'll, I want to make sure we give Andrew some love here. He's a good friend of the show. He says, yeah. I've been reading up on Kant's transcendental idealism, which we've been talking yeah. about, and he wants to know in what sense is it Aristotelian? So yeah, I think we you know, this over this a little bit, but go ahead yeah. and give us the quick... So, be, so, be, so it's Aristotelian in a number of ways. Firstly, it's that um, perceptual experience makes objects available for, for thought. So it's objects which bring thought into operation. But we don't just sit there and have thoughts. It brings our faculty for thinking into operation, i.e. the agent intellect. So we experience something we don't understand that the agent intellect kicks in, makes sense of it, and we thereby have knowledge. So there is an interaction between passivity and agency. And that's at the heart of the Aristotelian view. It's the Platonic view that we just receive knowledge from the forms, that we just forget about experience and just receive knowledge from the forms. What Aristotle notices is that we have to wrestle with experience and just squeeze some sort of intelligibility out of it um, <clears throat> by uh, means of the agency of our intellect. So that's more or less 
how it's Aristotelian, but also this idea that experience, that the content of experience is conceptually loaded mm -hmm. um, and so available for judgment. That's Aristotelian as well, because experience is always experience of a formed substance. Yes. So our experience carries with it a form that we can recognize, but we need to be the ones that make the judgment. So, and that's what Kant's categories are all about. Great answer. Thank you for that. Um, Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship says, uh, well, this is related to your other uh, talk mm -hmm. we uploaded, but uh, he wants yeah. to know, uh, when considering the supposite nature distinction, what kind of distinction, Gavin? Is this a real distinction or what? Yeah, it's a real distinction. Mm -hmm. The supposite and the nature for which it supposits are not identical. So I'm an individual supposite and I supposit for humanity. I'm not identical to humanity. Humanity is really distinct from me. Mm -hmm. I'm, if, if I were identical to humanity, every human would be Gavin. So there's a real distinction between my humanity and me. Right, right on. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so, that, so that's it. That's, uh, you know, so it's a real distinction there. Yeah. Hugo says, I've recently began to read Augustine's Free Choice of the Will and Aquinas Expands on it. What's a good book to help a beginner like me to grasp God's omnipotence and our free will both? being true if i can real quick gavin i just had matthews grant on I was talk about to... god's universal causality and human freedom yeah. so i have to at least give that a mention because it seems like it's directly related uh yeah. to this question but you now you go mm -hmm. yeah that's the best book i've read on the issue to date i met matthews in new orleans at the acpa oh wonderful uh, Mm -hmm. I attended his talk and we got chatting about per se ordered series, creation, God's basic mm -hmm. action, um, and scomian intentions, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Matt Matthews is a great guy, um, but it, it, his book would be the one. Um, but uh, now he says, you know, a, a book to help a beginner grasp God's omnipotence and free will. I mean, I found Matthew's book, you know, I, I'm not a beginner and, you know, there's some parts that I had to be quite... It's a technical in, book. It's not a beginner book. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe something, maybe Eleanor Stumps Aquinas, um, you know, there's a chapter in that on omnipotence and there's a chapter in that on free will. Um, that That is written for, you know, the interested uh, beginner. Yeah. Looks, you know, like Pat, a, that, looks like a dog shoot on this one, didn't it, Gavin? Yeah. But that, here it is. That's mortal sin. I think I that's a mortal sin. <laughs> I, know, poor, <laughs> I know. Stubbs' poor book. Just, this was actually, I mean, I'm pretty rough with my books. Uh, you know, I wrestle with the text, right? But I'm pretty sure this this catastrophe was the result of one of my children. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, it's a great book. It really is. Uh-huh. So, but, yeah, so I'd, but I'd look what book is them. still in good shape here, Gavin, because it's hardcover. <laughs> it's hardback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, Hugo says, where can I find the chat between you and Matthew? Like literally one episode back, I think. <laughs> just it was like just yesterday. So go for it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yep. Uh, Callum says, what does Gavin think of the formal distinction? I wonder how it would affect the deente argument. So is that, I take it this is Scotus's um, formal distinction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Scotus's formal distinction is that there are distinct formalities in things. Um, so uh, the, 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 their distinction corresponding to our conceptual episodes. So the, the, the Peterness of Peter and the humanity of Peter, um, they're distinct in the thing. Um, but it's something less than a real distinction and something more than just a logical distinction. Um, so what do I think of that objective formal distinction? Um, I can't make sense of it. So I'm just going to say that I can't make sense of it. I see what uh, Scotus is getting at, that Peter's Peterness isn't identical to Peter's humanity. But that's because Peter is an individual which supposits for humanity. And so there's a real distinction between that individual and his humanity. What I think is going on in the background here is that for Scotus, modality is synchronic. So it's a possible world's modality. And so there are many possible worlds in which Peter exists, but maybe isn't identical to his humanity. So um, uh, individuation uh, is not world bound. So Peter, as an individual, is not bound to this one world, uh, and th and this is you know comes down to Scotus's rejection of um, uh, matter as the principle of individuation. If matter is the principle of individuation, then Peter's Peterness is just an effect of his humanity being individuated in that way. In which case, you know, 
there needn't be this objective formal distinction between the hecatas and the quiditas of uh, the, the, the individual existent. So I can't make sense of it because I don't adopt the same theory of modality that Scotus does. Now, if Scotus were right, okay, if there were an objective formal distinction, which is not quite real, but which is more than logical, then essence and existence would be like that. And given that essence and existence wouldn't be really distinct, uh, we wouldn't be able to get to the anti-argument off the ground. Because mm -hmm. essence and existence need to be distinct in order to get the Dante argument for God's existence off the ground. Yeah, so help me think <clears> through <throat> that uh, a little bit here, Gavin, because I recently put up, I, I sent you the link of my mm -hmm. objection to moving from contingency to the real distinction, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I was, I had uh, an argument that Phaser gives, and like a like Phaser's work a lot, and I agree with, with most of it, but I, it, it just doesn't seem right to me that mm -hmm. contingency itself establishes the real distinction on, on Thomas's view anyways, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> the existence of every of, of me and of you is to use Norris Clark's language fresh out of the oven, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It is a, it is a bounded existence, right? Mm -hmm. It is the existence of Pat or the existence of Gavin. It is an existence that is crucially mm -hmm. dependent upon Pat or Gavin or Thumper the rabbit for its individual individualization, right? So it is itself a dependent Active mm -hmm. existence, so yeah. you can you can still have the contingency there, mm -hmm. right? Even if the distinction between a creature and its active existence wasn't mm -hmm. real. Now I'm not denying the real distinction, but I'm saying that I think Phaser is a little too quick moving from contingency to the real distinction. Do you think that's right? And I'd like to get your further thoughts on on the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that sounds fine to me. That um. What I think gets, you know, the real distinction off the ground is the, the multiplicity argument. Um, if you have, you know, multiple, you know, existence, you have multiple acts of existence, um, which are multiplied, you know, in distinct essences. So there has to be an essence which receives and thereby individuates um, the existence. Um, so and, and none of those acts of existence could be pure existence itself. Uh, and if there could only be one possible, you know, being, which is pure existence itself, regardless of whether or not it exists, if we have, you know, multiple existence, then they're not that. They're not something in which essence and existence are identical. So they're things in which essence and existence are distinct. Yeah. So I think noticing contingency gives you an obvious real distinction between um, any finite entity and unbounded existence, for mm -hmm. sure. But mm -hmm. I think um, I don't think it'll work to give you a real distinction between any finite entity and its existence. Yeah, because it's it's not like you know Scotus and Henry of Ghent and all those and, and Occam who rejected the, the real distinction. It's not like they um, hang, didn't notice contingency. Um, the, you know they reject you know the the real distinction between active existence on basically metaphysical grounds pertaining to act and potency uh, and the main reason why they reject it and you know that, that this always comes up a lot in these discussions so it might be worth um sort of emphasizing it mm -hmm. when thomas says that essence and existence are distinct he doesn't think they're separate okay he no separability not... right mm -hmm. yeah well they're separable i can lose my existence and i i will cease to be okay but in being distinct they don't exist. Here's essence and here's existence, and they're just conjoined. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, that's not. So the act of existence is the act of the essence. It's what actualizes the essence. So it's composed. They're composed as act and potency, just like matter and form in the statue are composed mm -hmm. as act and potency. So they 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 compose to form a unit, but they're distinct because they're non-identical mm -hmm. to each other. So it's the non-identity and non-identity of the two in the real thing which means they are really distinct, okay? Right, so sp spell that out through the act potenc potency analysis for people, if you don't mind. So, you yeah. know, how you would uh, show the sort of ontological parts, if you will, here, yeah. where there's a clear ordering of priority, right? Because that that is what I think is ultimately more convincing for getting to the real distinction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a difference between conjunction, when two things are conjoined, and composition. Two things that are conjoined are already actual. They're two actualities just joined together. Mm -hmm. But when you have composition, you have two components, one of which stands in potency to be actualized by the other. So the matter of the marble, the, the, the marble of the statue stands in potency to whatever form 
that the artist gives it. Once given that form, it is actually now what you actually have is the star, uh, the star, the, the statue of David. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the the marble is not identical to the form, but in this instance, the marble doesn't exist without the form. Okay, so they're not separate things. You know, matter form. Okay, mm-hmm. just conjoined to each other. They're united or composed in the thing of which they are the matter and form. And it's the same as essence and existence. Existence actualizes the essence to produce the existent, which is Gavin or whatever. So even though Gavin can't exist without his essence or his existence, that doesn't mean they're, they're identical in Gavin. Okay, mm-hmm. They're distinct precisely because it is the act of existence which actualizes Gavin's essence thereby bringing about the existing thing, which is Gavin. And they, and they, think, and they serve uh, fundamentally distinct roles that where yeah. one is not reducible to the other as well, which yeah. is critical, I think, to point out. Mm-hmm. And, and that's part of uh, uh, the, the non-identity um, thing. Um, uh, and just to con- carry on with that, um, I think those who criticize the distinction between essence and existence do so because they think they think of essence and existence as being conjoined. When we say when Thomas say that they're really distinct, they think it's the conjunction of two things and they reason, well, look, if you can have the essence without the act of existence, that essence has some sort of existence to it. So we don't need an act of existence. We already have uh, an existing essence. And the historical culprit for this was a follower and defender of St. Thomas after his death in Paris. Giles of Rome, mm. he defended the distinction between the between essence and existence as a distinction between two things. He literally says to res, and mm. it's it's it, it's against him that Scotus and the Franciscans uh, and all the others are reacting. It's against Giles of Rome. It's not actually against Thomas. Yeah, that's that's a, important to point out. And you know, as Norris Clark emphasizes, the real distinction is a very powerful piece of metaphysical mm. machinery, but an extremely subtle one as well. And I just noticed that Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship, um, I think that he asked about the opposite nature distinction. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm trying to understand why the distinction is real if no nature exists without a concrete subject. Can we separate the two? And this is precisely what we're addressing here when we're talking about a real distinction. Okay. A real distinction need not involve separation. It could be a distinction between act and potency. Okay. So when uh, the, the supposite the supposite stands in potency to the nature for the nature that it has, but the nature stands in potency to the supposite in order to have actuality uh, in, in reality. So just because we say that they are distinct from each other doesn't mean that we can separate the two of them. Right, 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 <clears throat> right, 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 right. Yeah, that's uh, all sounds right and good to me. Uh, and I actually like Scotus a lot, but Scotus doesn't run a Deante argument. You know, he's got a sort of a very interesting modal argument. A modal uh, ontological argument. But uh, I think you're right, Gavin. I think uh, I think we need that real distinction if we're going to get Deante up and up and running, right? Mm, yeah, I think so. All right, let's take one or two more here if you're down for it, Gavin. Here's one on a yeah. personal level. Danny says, what would you say to someone having an, a real existential crisis about the possibility of the evil demon or simulation hypothesis being true and just unsatisfied with the philosophical and theoretical responses. Yeah, they're just really having a lot of anxiety or something over this, Gavin. What do you recommend to somebody? Philosophy can give that to people sometimes, yeah. (laughs) So what I'll say is that if you're having an existential crisis brought on by, you know, something about evil demon or simulation hypothesis, stop reading philosophy, okay? Just stop it. Um, Descartes sets this thing up um, to, to basically divorce you from real life. He's got a, you know, a, a completely artificial account of what experience is uh, and how experience and understanding you know, d- disclose a world to us and make a world available to us. For anybody who thinks that the understanding sort of just floats above experience and tries to make sense of experience, step into a martial arts gym where you have to fight someone and you realize <laughs> that you know your intelligence is deeply you know, embedded within your experience. Experience is not a non-intellectual affair. Experience is a cognational activity. Okay, Mm. our experience of the world is not the same as a dog's experience of the world. We're not having the same experiences because our experiences, uh, you know, embed our cognition. Whereas a dog not having the sort of higher cognition that we have, you know, uh, doesn't. So, you know, um, 
I would just say for somebody having an existential crisis, firstly, for anybody having an existential crisis, you're having the problem of authenticity, okay, with being fully human. And to be fully human, you have to do human things. And intellectual activity is only one human things. Moral agency is another human things. Use of your body physically in the, in the world is another human activity. Uh, existential crises are always generated whenever one isn't being authentically are fully human such, so a good, in, such a good response keep going please yeah mm -hmm. so engage every aspect of your humanity join a gym go you know fight somebody in a cage play an instrument play a sport read classical literature listen to classical music be with those whom you love and the existential crisis um will fade because uh, you'll just notice that experience is a fully conscious activity which engages you with the world and is not the um you know the 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 activity of an evil demon right and you know, it's such that's so that's such a good reminder don't sit in a closet like i am and just mm -hmm. read descartes all day you're just asking for trouble at that point right <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> let's take this one from from matt mm -hmm. dear matt good to hear from you he says professor kerr you said on a previous podcast that kant and hegel are critical realists in a similar vein as aquinas could you elaborate on this? And how can I read your doctoral thesis? Yeah, yeah. So no problem. So, well, Kant, we'll, we'll be sort of talking, you know, uh, about Kant here. That Kant, Kant, is a, Kant is a thoroughly realist thinker. The intuition makes objects available um, for thought. Intuitions without concepts are blind. So the object made available intuition is conceptual in some sort of way. Thought without intuition is empty. Thought has no content were it not for the content of intuition, which gives us the object of thought. So we have an object which has conceptuality or intelligibility about it made, being made available to thought through intuition uh, by which we can form a judgment about it. That's just, I mean, that's plain old Aristotelian realism, agent intellect abstracts, you know, forms a proposition about the object of experience. That's Kant. Hegel is something like that. You know, Hegel has this whole, you know, sort of the movement of the spirit. And so, I mean, you, you have the spirit moving through history, you know, towards greater and greater perfection. Mm -hmm. uh, but also when it comes to, you know, understanding, you know, you have movement of the spirit or the concept. And so at some point of the movement of the spirit, the conceptual concept, content of experience or perceptual experience um, is grasped. Um, I'm not as familiar with Hegel as I would like to be. I've only read his critique of naive realism um, in, in the phenomenology and his whole account of sensory consciousness and sensory experience. But sensation itself is, is a conscious activity for Hegel. And if it's a conscious activity, sensation has to trade in a content which is available to consciousness, which is a conceptual content. Um, for anybody who wants to read up, you know, just on Hegel and, you know, Hegelian realism, critical realism, Kenneth Westphal, um, is the author on that. He, I think he wrote his doctoral thesis on Hegel's epistemic realism, which is published through, what do you call that really expensive, you know, um, sort of published, I think Brill or Springer, maybe, where their books are like, you know, over a hundred, two hundred dollars, I think. Seems you know, like all of them these days, honestly, is I constantly yeah. get mulked on these academic books. Yep. Mm -hmm. But but read Kenneth Westphal, read Paul Geyer, read John McDowell, um, read, uh, what do you call your man, uh, Brandom, Robert Brandom, on Hegel. Um, it, it was really Sellers in that Pittsburgh school that, you know, brought Hegel back um, into analytical philosophy by depicting Hegel as, you know, restoring, you know, a better sense of the objective world uh, where analytical philosophy had gone astray. So read the whole Pittsburgh school um, as well. Uh, they're great on both Kant and Hegel. Yeah. Hey, last one real quick, and then we'll close out and hear what you're up to, Gavin. Uh, Danny says, what are your thoughts on Heidegger's being in time? I know he briefly addresses both external world skepticism and authenticity, which you just mentioned. Quick thoughts on, on Heidegger. Yeah. I think uh, Heidegger is one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century. Um, although when it comes to his political uh, views and outlooks, you know, he's entirely suspect, not entirely suspect. <laughs> he's entirely, you know, to be condemned. Um, but uh, I think being in time is a work of genius because in being in time, Heidegger points out, you know, what is um, our primary mode of engagement in the world? Well, it's through Dasein, okay? And what is Dasein? Dasein is basically, you know, our rational animality. 
being present in the world. Uh, and so what he does is he does a phenomenological analysis of what the world is like for us. And this is chapter three, if I remember correctly, of being in time. And you've got the worldhood of the cogito, the world as being an object over and beyond us. But you've got the world as a, an immersive experience, you know, that Dasein undergoes. And the world is made available to us, not just through rational thought, but also in mood. Do you ever notice that when you're in... Um, uh, when you're in a certain mood that you know some parts of the world seem more present to you than other parts oh, of sure. the world yeah um, yeah. Heidegger, does, Heidegger does a whole analysis um, of that high you know there's different aspects features of reality made available to us through mood through poetry okay um, but our basic mode of uh, existence in the world is not by standing in this sort of rational relation of being at a distance from the world it's through circumspective concern OK, it's through our concernful dealings with things. So think about it. Um, you know, you're a child. OK, so you've got, you know, practically a newborn, Briga. Um, That's right. A minute. Five months yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five months. Brilliant. Congratulations. Thank Briga you. recognizes. Briga recognizes mommy and daddy. OK, mm -hmm. by now, five months in the world. Briga recognizes mommy and daddy. Now think, think of the amount of conceptual processing Briga at five months old has to do to recognize mommy and daddy. First of all, she has to distinguish you as substances within the world, as continuous substances within the world, from a whole background array, you mm -hmm. know, of other substances which are available to her. That's a lot of conceptual cognitive processing mm -hmm. going on right there for five months, and she doesn't even have language. She She's can't even a powerhouse. Yeah. And so th this is something that Heidegger sort of pointed out, that we have this circumspective concern. Briga has concern for mommy, for daddy, caregivers, okay? And that's her mo that that's the world which is made available to her through her concern. She's not concerned about your podcasting equipment sitting in the room. She's concerned about you. Uh, and maybe why daddy is, you know, ignoring me for the podcasting equipment, um, you know, or all the books which are sitting around you. She's not concerned about those. Um, whereas your circumspective concern is for your books around you, you know, for gaining wisdom and philosophy and all that. And hopefully you've got concern for Briga as well when she's present and more concern for her that rather than the books. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so this is part of Heidegger's analysis um, in Being in Time. Now, when it comes to authenticity and Being in Time, real quick, um, Heidegger uh, points out um, that... Um, most people just, you know, they experience thrownness. They're just in the world. They're thrown into the world, and mm. they never realize, you know, their full potential. And what do we mean by their full potential? We don't mean by becoming an MMA fighter or whatever. We mean by being fully human. They, they're always das man, okay? They're always just this unauthentic, inauthentic individual. To be authentic, to be fully human, is to embrace humanity in its fullness, and what is special about Dasein, about the human? The human or the Dasein is somebody whose being is there for them. Right. Our, our being is there for us, and we can entertain our being as being there for us. How do we do that? Because we are always, every day, fully conscious that we could be nothing, that our being could cease to be. Not that death occurs at some sort of future, that death is always on the human horizon, that our being could not be there for us. And that's how we become authentic. And so um, to be fully authentic is to realize that and embrace that, uh, which means for Heidegger, no Christian can never be authentic because for Christians, your being, there is never the possibility that your being is not there for you because of, you know, afterlife, resurrection, eternal life. Um, yeah. So being can never be there for the Christian, in which case the Christian can't think through the question of being. So the idea of a Christian philosopher is a round square. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So Christians aren't having a good time for Heidegger. You know, they can't be authentic and they can't be philosophers. Um, <clears throat> you, seem to, you seem to maybe have uh, changed his position a little bit on his deathbed there, perhaps. There's some rumors, isn't it? <laughs> oh, really? Right. <laughs> so I thought there were rumors that uh, there's some sort of close deathbed conversation with a priest or something like that. And it's not exactly sure what went on. But I, actually, I thought he had a Christian or Catholic burial or something. Right. I remember so people yeah. should fact check me on that though uh, for sure okay mm -hmm. i see a question there by nate just at the very bottom if you've got time gavin i've got time go for it yep mm -hmm. so um what what naive realism is or why it's a problem naive realism is the view that um the object of our knowledge or the objects of our knowledge they are real objects yes but that we don't have to use our thought in order to know them it's as if the object just sort of you know 
by osmosis enters into our minds. Mm-hmm. That we, we don't have to engage our thinking faculties in order to think um, about those objects. So it's a realism. Yes, we have real objects, but it's naive uh, as opposed to critical um, because uh, we don't have to engage thinking. Um, whereas when we engage thinking, that's it's just a Kantian term. Um, uh, we're being critical. Uh, we're, we're, and that's interchangeable with transcendental. We're, you, we're, we're, we're asking what are the transcendental conditions for the possibility of the thoughts that we are having. So naive realism is the view that denies that we have to engage our intellect um, whenever, uh, you know, we have knowledge. Um, and it's a problem for a number of reasons. First of all, it's, it leads to a kind of a representationalist view about knowledge that, you know, by some sort of osmosis, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the knowledgeable content of objects enters our minds the way, you know, furniture enters, you know, enters the empty room of a house. Um, but second of all, it's just not what happens whenever you know we're gaining knowledge because every time we gain knowledge there's a kind of an agency involved and we're not just talking you know about sitting trying to figure out you know a difficult text or trying to figure out a difficult scientific problem think about you know the different sort of experiences that you know two people have on the beach one person who's on holiday having on the beach having drinks and the other is the marine biologist on Mm. the beach the marine biologist's intellect is engaged in trying to think about you know all the different marine life on the beach the person on holiday is just shutting down having drinks not thinking what i'm going to be doing after this podcast just crashing and burning after a crazy semester um that their intellect isn't engaged but if the naive realist is correct both those individuals are undergoing the same intellectual operations um which is just false because you know the marine biologist is trying to kind of you know come to terms with you know all the the, the stuff around him or her whereas the person having a drink on the beach is not um so there has to be some sort of agency to the intellect and if there is then uh naive realism or a realism which isn't critical uh is ruled out so um i i hope i hope for nate that you know sort of just that was great sets the issue up yeah brilliant gavin this has been a brilliant conversation, as always. Extremely, extremely awesome. Uh, okay. So before, yeah, and, and seriously, it, it's always, it's, it's always such a joy. So before we say goodbye, I uh, just tease something. You know, anything else you're going to be working on, or you want people to keep an eye out for? Or everybody's asking about an update on the resurrection book. Um, that uh, the survivalism, corruptionism paper um, is part of a central chapter of that book where I'm dealing with the intermediate state. The intermediate state has been dealt with. Um, We're survivalists. Aquinas was a survivalist. Don't let anybody... (laughs) And that's the the end of it. (laughs) (laughs) So... He says brandish in the big sticks. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, 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 that's embedded in that chapter on the intermediate state. Done on to the resurrected chapter on the resurrected state now. And this is going to be so cool, this chapter on the resurrected state, because not only am I going to be talking about, you know, kind of what needs to be in place for the resurrected state, you know, how we have the same body back and everything. I also get to engage in the, na- in the nature, super nature debate whether there's a pure human nature or is it just super nature are we you just read uh bentley hart's book that bentley, you're god bless us right <laughs> okay um well or not you know um you know given that we have this divine destiny does that make us supernatural mm-hmm. by creation by default that we are supernatural because we have a supernatural destiny or does it mean that you know the supernatural is our final end you know, so I'm I'm getting into that chapter now. So the book is at about 60,000 words. I'm getting into that chapter. That's going to, you know, be several thousand words. And I'm sorry it's taken a long time. I got, hey, I got caught up. Do. Yeah. I got caught up with a lot. Of, I, I've published a lot <laughs> in between the last book and, you know, this this new book on the resurrection. I got caught up in a lot of different things. Um, so. Plus, I just got lazy at some points as well during COVID. <laughs> I don't know about lazy. Sometimes you just need to switch gears and focus and get your mind off of something for a while and then come back to it. At least I do. Yeah. You know, I, you can focus on something so hard for a while that uh-huh. you you actually do worse at it. You know, you, oh, you yeah. do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, you know what I mean. Yep. Mm-hmm. You get you get you get fatigued. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You completely fatigued and you know burnt out. That was me after my doctorate on you know all this Kantian stuff and philosophy of mind, which is why. I, you know, was bored and got into metaphysics and started writing about the Dante. Mm. So, but I've done that for 10 years. So maybe I'll have another 10 year cycle and get into the epistemology stuff again. Love it. I think there's much, uh, 
much possibility <clears throat> for advancements in Thomistic epistemology still. So I would yeah. love to uh, to see that happen. Gavin, thank yeah. you so much. It's been a joy. Thank you, gentle mm -hmm. listeners. If you like what we're doing here, the best thing you can do to help us out is leave your comments, engage, share, subscribe, ring the bell. All that stuff really makes a difference. So thank you for your participation, and we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thank you.